Today I'm going to step through the process to design a shear pin for a single shear lap shear joint. And then we'll go through and apply this example in Excel. So in the aerospace and defense industry a lot of times you'll have shear pins or dowel pins to align two parts together. So you'll run into this scenario a lot, uh, especially as a mechanical design engineer. So there's some design considerations you need to make in order to design your joints to be structurally sound. There's some considerations like the bearing strength of the material you need to keep in the back of your head. So the bearing strength of the material is basically the contact or interaction between the dowel pin and the uh, joint. Um, and so we're going to relate that to the bearing line load to determine a contact stress. Also the pullout strength of the material. So that's related to the shear force between the dowel pin and the joint and also the down shear pin strength itself and we're going to simplify this analysis by applying a beam and socket analysis which is basically going to combine bending and shear in a simple manner so that we can determine our shear and bending moment diagram so we can evaluate these three criteria and make sure our joints are structurally sound. So as a mechanical engineer the first thing you want to do is draw a free body diagram. So we can see up here we have uh, a joint single shear lap joint. We have a force working at the mid span of the top joint and at the mid span of the bottom joint and we have some gap between the two. And the thickness of the joints is T sub 1 and T sub 2. So if we just consider the, if we're just looking at the bottom joint, we just want to look at that joint, we can basically assume that it's uh, a triangular load. So if you think of pulling this top joint with the force of the top, you have to have a reacting distributed load on the bottom where it's going to press to the left on top and then it's going to push um, right on the bottom somewhere. So you can think of it or visualize it as the dowel pin being cockeyed and that's the type of distribution uh, you can assume. So we can't really do much with this. I mean, yeah, you know, if you apply your equilibrium equations, you can't really deduce any information about this line load. So in order to simplify it, we replace this line load right here, or triangular load, with a reaction force and a reaction moment. This is known as beam in a socket analysis. And we just apply the equilibrium equations to determine our reaction force and reaction moment, which we assume acts at the midspan of the joint. So reaction force turns out to be equal to the applied force at the top in our reaction moment. You just take this, uh, some of your moments at this point. It's simply going to be the distance from there to the external load multiplied by that force. So in order to, uh, once we determine the reaction moment and the reaction force, we have to deduce some line loads from this so we can determine our bearing line load and subsequently calculate our bearing stress. So when we think of bearing, we think of projected area. So this pin is going to be pressed against a rectangular area on the joint with a length of uh, equal to the thickness of the joint and then the width being the diameter of the pin. And so when we think of it like this, we can deduce a line load by simply multiplying our stress by the diameter. That'll convert it to units of pounds per inch. So for a, for a reactive force, we're going to assume that it's going to be a uniform distributed load across the length that it's acting. So we get this equation right here which is a reaction force divided by the length of our joint, our bottom joint. And now we have to uh, deduce our moment into a line load. In order to do that, we just apply my over i, which comes from solid mechanics, and we multiply that by d, and we end up with this equation right here. And it's important to remember or consider the sign convention. In this case, the sign convention where Q is pointing down is positive. And that's, you need to be consistent with that. Just, you know, be warned. So now we have our distributed loads. We have functions for them. Now what we want to do is we want to add them together. But what I want to do is I want to move our origin of our moment induced line load to the left. So it starts at the beginning of our joint. And you can see here that 
in order to do that um, we have to um, add t sub t subscript 2 divided by 2 to move it to the left and we end up getting this equation once we do that so we just add it that comes from algebra 2 we all should know how to do that and so after we do that we can add them together and we can get our bearing line load in units of pounds per inch across the length t subscript 2 of that bottom joint that's our distribution. The next step we want to do is we want to determine our worst case bearing line load. Once we do that, we can determine a bearing pressure by simply introducing our diameter D, dividing that line load by the diameter D gives us units of pressure or PSI. And then we can subsequently determine our margin of safety for our bearing strength, in this case um, our bearing ultimate and our bearing yield. So after we've deduced our line load we can apply integration to determine our shear force distribution and that's simply going to be equal to the negative integral of our line load which you can apply numerical methods, the trapezoidal rule, which we'll do in Excel. And then you have to add a constant because you integrated, you have to solve for a boundary condition. So to solve for that boundary condition, you have to be kind of clever. So we're going to apply the method of sections. We're basically going to make a cut down this beam and we're going to solve for our shear force at x equals zero. That'll give us our boundary condition that we need to develop our shear force distribution. So the distance here is going to be T1 plus the gap. And we simply apply our equilibrium equations, our force equilibrium equations, and we can determine our C1 which equals to our force, our applied external force F. So once we've done that, we can apply that boundary condition at our origin here and then apply the trapezoidal rule to get our shear force distribution with our max being at the bottom in this case. Once we determine our max shear force, we can determine our pull out or shear out stress and calculate our margin of safety. In addition, we can go ahead and calculate our worst case stress in our dowel pin using this equation right here which represents the max shear stress at the middle for a cylinder or circular cross section. And then you can also determine your average shear stress if, if that's what you want to do and then your margins of safety. So now that we have our shear force distribution we can determine our moment distribution simply by integrating again and once again we just apply the trapezoidal rule and we end up with a boundary condition we have to solve for we solve for that boundary condition using method of sections at x equals zero using the left half of this dowel pin applying the moment equilibrium equations um, it's pretty easy we get our our boundary condition c2 equal to this right here and when we apply that we end up with our distribution that's our boundary condition and then we apply the trapezoidal rule and then from here we determine our max moment um, on this half of the beam right here because we're x equals zero to the right represents this half of our dowel pin we can use that max moment to determine our worst case bending stress on our dowel pin which is simply just using these equations and then determine a margin of safety and that's it I mean, we, we basically, uh, that's the concepts we're going to apply in the uh, upcoming Excel demonstration. But I do want to emphasize the sign convention used because if you don't stay consistent with your sign convention, you could throw all this out in the water. It's not worth your time. So in my application, um, my sign convention that I use, I uh, use it just, you can look it up in a textbook, but I remember it like this positive shear force acts clockwise against the material so if you make a cut here on a beam of some sort uh, on the left side here your shear force is going to act clockwise against that face on the right side it's going to act the opposite direction which is still clockwise against that face and then if you look at the middle it's equal and opposite and you can tell that it acts clockwise on the face and then the positive bending moment 
uh, compresses the upper part of the beam. So in the left half here, it's positive bending moment is going this way. On the right half, it's going this way. It compresses the top half of the beam. And then on the bottom here, um, it's compressing the top face here on this side and on this side. And then for our line loads, um, Q is positive. If you keep that sign convention, Q is positive, you can apply these differential equations, which we applied previously, um, you know, in the in this demonstration, where our shear stress, uh, the slope of our sh shear force, excuse me, is equal to the negative of our line load, and then the derivative of our moment or slope of our moment curve is equal to our shear force. And so you see here our uniform load is positive going down which represents what we did earlier and then right here our line load equation um, it's compressing up here or it's pointing down the line load is pointing down right here so it's positive and then it crosses the x-axis and turns negative so the whole point is just be consistent in whatever you choose um, I emphasize that because I've messed up before so just be aware this can't happen without doing this so hope you enjoyed the video and I'll talk to you next time adios